Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Pastor Mike, Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Wednesday night, night, Cutting It Right Bible Study. I'm here with another Bible study for your heart, <clears throat> excuse me, and for your soul. We come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is able to do for you what no one else can do. Amen. We are streaming right now live over Facebook, live over YouTube, live over Periscope slash Twitter. We bless the Lord. If you're watching over Facebook, you can go ahead and start sharing uh, this page that others also may be blessed on tonight. If you're watching on Periscope, you can retweet that others also may be blessed. You can find all of our podcasts over Spreaker.com. That is Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. You go there, you'll find all of our podcasts there. We have several other podcasts that we have produced and we do still produce. And you can go to our website at That's the Word.org. And you can also go to our YouTube channel, That's the Word Ministries. Or you can type in Pastor Michael James. That'll bring you right there. And once there, you can subscribe, we pray, to our podcast. Amen. And so we bless the name of the Lord and we thank him for what he is doing. We are right now in the middle of a powerful series, study series, uh, uh, entitled The the uh, Fivefold Ministry. We're exploring the fivefold ministry and we're talking about uh, the pastor's place. Uh, we began talking about the pastor's place uh, last week. And this week we're going to get into part two of the pastor's place, just what is his role and what is the role of those that are under him, that is the sheep, amen? And so we're going to pray and we're going to get right into our study for tonight. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again for blessing us and keeping us another day. Lord, we pray that for the next few minutes, Lord, that you will be the silent listener to all that we do. Lord, I pray that you will have your way in our hearts and in our lives, Lord Jesus. Speak to us right now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, we bless the name of the Lord. Once again, if you're watching <clears throat> over Facebook, you can share this page that others may be blessed. And if you are watching uh, over Periscope, uh, you may also retweet that others also may be blessed. Amen. <clears throat> Got a little hitch. Got a little hitch in the in the throat tonight. <clears throat> Amen. Well, uh, we are going to start now. Remember last week. Last week, just to go over just a little bit of what we were talking about last week, we talked about the pastor's life and ministry. We talked about what the pastor's life and ministry should be marked by. We said that the pastor's ministry should be uh, marked by denial. Denial. In other words, not seeking fame, not seeking fortune, uh, not seeking any sort of self-fulfillment. We said that the pastor's life uh, should be marked by discernment. That is, he should know the difference between truth and error. That is a very sticky situation. We'll get into that a little bit more. We got into it a little bit last week, but we're going to get into it a little bit more on tonight. Uh, the pastor needs to have a life that is marked by discernment. There is so much false teaching and false doctrine going around. Churches are being permeated by it. And the pastor, the pastor is the watchman, ladies and gentlemen. The pastor is the one who is supposed to be the shepherd to make sure that false teaching doesn't get into the church. That's why the pastor needs to be discerning, needs to be discerning. Okay, we said that the pastor needs to live a life of dedication, dedication, devoted to God's plan, devoted to God's purpose and devoted to his will. Once again, not trying to become something on his own. It's all about the work of the Lord. Finally, we said that the pastor's life and ministry should be marked by durability. Durability. In other words, able to withstand the hard times. Able to withstand the storm. Trust me, you will, you will find as a pastor, there will be difficult times. You're dealing with people and sometimes people can be difficult. And you will have to deal with all types of individuals in your ministry, there will be trials, there will be opposition uh, from within and from without, from inside the church and outside the church. So you must be an individual of durability, not easily wavered, not easily giving up, not easily walking away when things are hard. If God has called you to it, he will give you the strength to be able to deal with it. Amen. We also said, speaking of the pastor's role. The pastor's role is the number one, to guide. The pastor's role is to guide. In other words, to lead, to guide, uh, to direct, to oversee. We find that in uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28. 
uh, the pastor's role is to guard. He is to guard, protect, to defend, to watch over. Once again, to make sure that wolves do not enter in. We find this in John chapter 10 and verses 12 and 13. Finally, we said that the, the pastor's role is to gird, to gird. From Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 12, let's read that. It says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is, that is the role of each member of the fivefold ministry, including the pastor. He is to gird, prepare, and equip. Another way we like to put it, the pastor is to heed, he is to read, he is to feed, and he is to lead. That's the work, life, and ministry of the pastor. A few scriptures that we mentioned last time. From 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 16. Scripture says to take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That's talking about the reading part. You need to make sure you know what scripture says. So that you will be armed and equipped when false doctrine comes. False doctrine is so pervasive that it will knock on your church door. It will knock on your church door. What will you do? Will you invite the wolf in? Will you become part of what the wolf is doing? Or will you refute it? Will you turn it down? You have to be very, very careful. Once again, it's going back to discernment. The pastor needs to be discerning. We spoke from 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 6. It says, if thou Put the brethren in remembrance of these things. Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Nourished up. We said we like that word. We like that phrase. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Nourished up. Are you as a pastor? Am I as a pastor? Am I nourished up? Am I nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine? Whereunto thou hast attained. We also spoke from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5, and verse number 2, where it says, Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. There, as we're talking about, the, the, the pastor is an overseer. He is to oversee the church. He is to oversee that local body that he has been called to, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Filthy lucre, we'll get into that in a little bit. Filthy lucre is talking about he should not be, the pastor should not be money hungry. That has been the downfall of many ministries, of many pastors, of many churches. Greedy for money. Trying to get money in very dishonorable and dishonest ways. It should not be taking place. Not of constraint, it says in this verse. Should not be a overbearing type of individual. It is not what I say goes. It is not that type of a ministry. No, no, no. So we must make sure that we understand the pastor's life, ministry, and role. Amen? Now, <clears throat> that's from last week. That's all from last week. Now, what, continuing on in part two of the pastor's place. Now, what should the pastor's preaching look like? What should the pastor's preaching look like? The pastor's preaching. Well, the pastor's preaching <clears throat> should, number one, be biblical. Biblical. The pastor's preaching should be biblical. I don't know if I can stress this any stronger. It should be biblical. Number one, meaning that it should not be political. Number two, meaning that it should not be social. OK, it must be biblical. It must be aligned with scripture, aligned with scripture without any deviation from truth. No deviation from truth. I know it's very, very tempting to become involved in the in the social dysfunction that we see happening in the world today. And we all have our own opinions and we can all have our own opinions and we all, but we all must come for what scripture says. As a pastor, as an individual who preaches the gospel, we must preach a word that people can receive 
and receive salvation. Politics is not going to save anyone. Changing how an individual votes in one way or another is not going to change the heart. All of those things have their place. They have their place. But as a minister of the gospel, as a pastor, as a bishop, because once again, pastor, bishop is the same thing. I know that's not how it is in today's church. Today's church, a bishop is here and a pastor is right here. You don't be, a, you're, you're, in today's church, you're a pastor and then you become a bishop. No, 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 no. Scripture is totally uh, not with that idea. In scripture, a pastor is a bishop, is a pastor, is an elder, is an overseer. And they're all the same. Different names for the same function. Now, <clears throat> as we said, it should be biblical, not political, not social. We must stay in scripture. Very tempting to get caught off and to get caught off and try to go in another direction when we see what's going on in the world. We must preach the gospel. So the pastor's preaching, the pastor's preaching should be biblical. Secondly, the pastor's preaching should be bold. Bold. And when I say bold, I'm talking about without compromise. Without compromise, undiluted, not watered down. Be careful when you be careful when you don't hear a pastor talk about the blood of Jesus. Be careful when you hear a pastor not speak about the cross of Christ. Be very very careful. There are churches, there are pastors uh, that refuse to mention the blood, that refuse to mention the cross because the cross was messy. The cross was dirty. Uh, it, 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 sort of, it sort of pushes people away. No, 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 no. You need to preach the cross. There would be no church if there wasn't a cross. We need to preach the cross and we need to preach it boldly. Boldly. No compromise. You cannot water down the cross. You cannot water down the blood of Jesus. If you try and water down the blood of Jesus or the cross, if you try to uh, misapply it, and if you try to uh, treat it as if it is something terrible, what you do, you create another gospel, which is no gospel at all. You create another Jesus. So you must Preach the undiluted, the undiluted, no compromise gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is from 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 2. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That, that is where our preaching must be. That is where our preaching must be centered. It must be centered on the cross. That doesn't mean that you preach about the cross every single time you step into the pulpit. But it, Jesus Christ must be the centerpiece of your preaching ministry. He's the centerpiece, the absolute centerpiece. Number three, not only should your the pastor's preaching be biblical, not only should it be bold, but it should be, and we're getting into what we just finished saying, it should be brimming, brimming with the gospel, brimming, overflowing with the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It should have the cross of Jesus Christ at its core. Amen. Here's what it says in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 6. And verse number 20. Ephesians chapter 6. And verse number 20. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. <clears throat> he says. For which I am an ambassador. In bonds. That therein I may speak boldly. As I ought to speak. Paul realized that he had no choice. Paul realized that he must speak boldly. He understood that he could not water down the word that was given to him. There was no way. Woe unto him if he preached not the gospel. The gospel. Not a version of it. Not a different brand of it. No. The full gospel. That is able to save heal, deliver, and set free the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul did. Now let's talk about the, the pastor's work ethic. The pastor's work ethic. Because here's what we mentioned last time we got together. We said that the, the pastor, 
the the pastor's uh, function is one percent inspiration and ninety nine percent perspiration. One percent inspiration, ninety nine percent perspiration. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. A lot of work. And that 1% of inspiration, when we talk about the 1% inspiration, we're talking about that time spent behind the pulpit on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night or on a Tuesday night. That time spent behind the pulpit, those 30 minutes, those 45 minutes, that one hour that the pastor spends behind the pulpit sometimes takes hours the Lord speaks. It doesn't all just come together like that. There is prayer. There is much prayer that goes into a 15, 20, 30, 45, uh, 45 minute uh, word to a congregation. There are many hours of preparation and time spent in prayer to bring that about. And so, yes, there is a work ethic involved in the pastor's life and ministry. Number one, he should be prepared, prepared. Second Timothy chapter four and verse number two, it says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's the life and ministry of the pastor. That's his work ethic. He should be prepared at all times. Be ready. Second thing. The pastor should be productive, productive, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth. That means, as it says in Romans chapter 12, I want, you to, want to bring you there right quick. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 11 makes a very strong statement concerning the lifestyle uh, and the work ethic of the pastor. Romans 12 and verse number 11. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. spirit serving the Lord. That means not slothful is talking about not lazy. Not being lazy. Whatever the pastor does must be done with passion. With a fervency. With diligence. With, with attention to detail. With responsibility. That's the work ethic ethic of the pastor. Thirdly, the work ethic of the pastor should be proficient. Proficient. He should be skilled in the word. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 13 says, for everyone who uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe. Verse 14. But strong meat belongs to them who are of full age even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What did we say earlier about the need for discernment in the pastoral ministry? The need for discernment. That discernment comes from your exposure. Time spent in the word of God. How much time does the pastor spend in the word of God? I'm going to read verse number 14 again. Strong meat, but strong meat belongs to them who are of full age. Talking about spiritual maturity. Even those who by reason of use, reading, studying, praying over, by reason of use, have their senses exercised. Their spiritual senses, our spiritual senses are exercised, are sharpened to help us to discern both good and and evil. That's how we attain to discernment. The more we read, the more we know, the more we understand, the more we're able to tell good from evil, right from wrong, truth from error. It is absolutely vital that the pastor is proficient, proficient in the word of God. I repeat again, the past for the pastor False doctrine is going to knock on your door. False doctrine is going to knock on your door. The church is permeated with false doctrine. It is prevalent. What will you do when it comes to your door? 
What will it do when it comes to the house of the Lord that you have been called over? You must be a watchman and you must not allow false doctrine to enter. You must be very careful who you allow on your pulpit to speak, who you allow to speak into your life, because pastors also have to have people speak into their life. Men of God, men and women of God, they must have a source. We know that the Lord is the ultimate source, but they must have that human source that speaks to them. Who do you listen to? You're the pastor. You're always giving out. You're always giving what the Lord gives to you. Who gives? Who, who do you receive from? It's necessary that you allow the right people to speak into your life as a pastor. It's so vital and so very necessary. So very necessary. Now, those are the, the prevalent and those are the, the uh, prevalent talking about the life and ministry of the pastor, talking about the pastor's role, talking about the pastor's preaching and work ethic. Work ethic. Now, I want to I want to shift just a little bit talking about churches, pastors and churches and and even the sheep that inhabit the churches. We call them sheep. The congregation is the sheep because the pastor is the shepherd. The shepherd, the bishop, the pastor, whatever whatever you call your pastor, some some prefer to be called bishop. Others prefer to be called pastor, but they're all the same. Please, please don't elevate a bishop above a pastor because it is unbiblical. A bishop is the same as a pastor. Doesn't matter if they wear a robe, have a big cross on it. Doesn't matter if they, that, all of that stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't make them better in any way. A pastor is a bishop. If you would call me Bishop Jakes, you would not be wrong. I don't prefer it, but you would not be wrong because I'm a pastor, I'm a bishop. That's scripture. That's scripture. All right? Now, here's another. Here, here's something that pastors need to be careful of. Pastors need to be careful of becoming celebritized. Celebritized. That, that's a word that you won't find in your dictionary. I think I just coined that phrase probably. Uh, megamized, that's another word. Megamized churches can mega megamized churches and ministries can create celebritized pastors all right now it's nothing wrong with exposure as long as that exposure he must increase we must decrease so there's nothing wrong with exposure if Christ is being exposed all glory must go to the lord listen we're not trying to go viral but we want his word to go viral. We want the message of the cross to grow, go viral. We're not trying to go viral ourselves. So it's a very fine line. We want people to see us. We want people to share. We want people to follow. But we're not trying to make a name for ourselves. We want his message to go out to as many people as he will allow. That's why we ask for followers. That's why we ask for people to share so that others will hear the word. We're not trying to get any fame or fortune here. So megamized churches and ministries can, can create celebritized pastors. And with that, sometimes things begin to crumble. Things can begin to crumble. The fact is that people are attracted to large churches with a pastor with a large name. We are attracted to those types of things. I'm sure many regard it as some sort of status symbol to go to a large, uh, what we call mega church. With a pastor who is renowned and well known. I'm quite sure that some feel is some sort of good thing. And there's nothing wrong with it. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with a mega church as mega churches go. So, it's not the size of the church or the prominence or preeminence of a particular pastor that matters. That does not matter. What matters is what flows from the pulpit. What flows from the pulpit? What is the message that comes from the sacred desk? What message does he preach? 
Does he preach the full counsel of God's word? The full counsel of God's word. Uh, is there a clear communication of the true gospel? That is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And this includes, of course, the resurrection. We understand that. But is there a clear communication of the true gospel? That is the mark of a good pastor. That is the mark of a good church. It doesn't have to be a big church. It doesn't have to be a mega church. Okay? Many times in mega churches, the mega amount of people that attend are not born again. And that, that happens to be a fact. So we must be careful about large churches. I've been to a large church. I've been to a medium-sized church. I've been to a small church. Listen, it's the message that comes from the pulpit. That is what is most important. So there's nothing wrong. Listen, there's nothing wrong with desiring to have uh, a larger ministry or a larger church. But the intent must always be to make his name known and not yours. That must always be the intent to make his name known. We don't want, we don't want to make a name for ourselves. We don't want to do that. So pastors, pastors must not get caught up in the fame game. Pastors must not get caught up in the money trap. We talked about the money trap when we spoke about uh, not desirous of filthy lucre, King James Version. That's talking about not be money hungry. Not be money hungry and not go about trying to, to have dishonest gain or dishonorable gain. Not trying to get finances in a very, very shifty, sneaky, underhanded way. That's not God's way. And that would be uh, that would be getting caught up in the money trap. That's not the pastor's way. Listen, listen, there are some ministries, there are some ministries whose focus, whose entire focus is simply money. Money. How you can get rich, how you can gain finances, how you can get more and have more and be more. And that's that's the that's the whole ministry. Never any and never any talk about the gospel. Never any talk about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Never any talk about how to how to live for the Lord. Nothing. It's all about how you can get money. That's not the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. That is not the gospel. Jesus, listen. I'm going to make a statement that you may not understand or you may not believe. You may not agree with. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ did not come. Hear me well. Jesus Christ did not come to make your life better. Ooh, 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 ooh. Did you What are you what are you talking about, Pastor? Did you, he, he didn't come to make our life better. That he came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to give you new life. Now, if you want to say that, that, that that's a better life, of course that's a of course we understand that's a better life than living in the world, than living in Christ. Understand what I mean. He did not come to give you a bigger bank account. He did not come to give you houses and lands. He did not come to give you a bigger car. He did not come for those things. That's not why he came. Jesus came to give life. Jesus came to get came to give abundant life. Abundant life. Abundant life has nothing to do with the amount of money in your bank account. He wants your spirit, soul, and body to prosper. He's not talking about finances. He is not speaking about finances. Finances, material things, are, are some of the things that are going to keep people out of heaven. The Bible says how hard it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. Why did he say that? Because they don't want to part with it. Jesus told the young, the rich young ruler, he told him to go and sell all he had and then come back. The Bible says that young man went away sorrowful because he had much riches. That means he didn't want to get let it go. Neither was Jesus saying that if you're rich, that you will never go to heaven. If you're rich, that no, 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 no. 
Yes, you can have riches and finances and be a, a, a child of God. Of course you can. But we must have the proper attitude toward money. And there are individuals within the body of Christ or that are a part of the body of Christ, at least in name, that are ruining people's lives because they are focusing on money alone. How you can make money. Schemes, how you can do it. Using Bible verses to try to prove points about how they can... Listen, listen. That's not what Jesus came for. That's not what Jesus came for. All right? So... Pastors much of, must avoid the money trap. It is a trap. Okay? And so for these reasons, the pastor needs to remain level-headed. Remain level-headed. This means don't believe the hype about yourself. Don't believe the hype about yourself. If, if there is some fame, if there is some fortune, if there is some renown, if there is some prominence that comes with you, your church, and your ministry, you must keep a level place. A level place. Don't believe the hype about yourself. <laughs> Someone once made the statement, <laughs> be careful how you treat the people that you meet on the way up because you're going to meet the same people on the way down. Okay, there's some truth in, in that humorous statement. So don't believe the hype about yourself. Okay, this is one of the reasons. This is one of the reasons why scripture says specifically that a pastor should not be a new convert. Should not be a new convert. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 6. It says, not a novice lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Not lifted up with pride. Not a novice. Not a newcomer. Not a brand new Christian. Be very, very careful. Now, when we talk about a novice, we're not, we're not talking about age. We're not talking about age. We're talking about maturity. We're talking about spiritual maturity. Okay? Spiritual maturity. There are people that have been in Christ, in Christ, for years, 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 who are not spiritually mature, as spiritual maturity goes. All of us are in the process of growing spiritually. All of us are in the process of maturing. So don't get me wrong. There's no point where you say, okay, I'm all mature, and I'm good. No, no, no. There's no graduating class in Christianity. But we say that there... When people should be teaching others, they're still sitting and learning. They're still, they're still not gotten over the hump. They're still at point A, where they should be at point B, C, D, E, F, and they're still at the bottom, doctrinally. Don't know the basics. Don't know what uh, justification is. Don't understand what grace is all about. Don't understand these things. They are still stuck on baby food. Strong meat belongs to those who are mature. You need to reach up. You need to reach higher. So the pastor should be that one who is mature, not a novice, not a brand new convert that doesn't understand the things of the Lord yet. That should not be the pastor. The next thing, the pastor needs to avoid, and this is very important, the pastor needs to avoid the itching ear syndrome. The itching ear syndrome. Now, all these things that you hear me speaking about on tonight and last week, I speak from a pastor's point of view. I'm a pastor. I speak from what I have gleaned, what I have learned, what I what I believe that the Lord has spoken to me, what I've, what I've understood to be pastor has to avoid the itching ear syndrome. The itching ear syndrome. In other words, don't feed into, into the temptation to give the people, listen very carefully now, don't feed into the temptation to give the people what they want. Okay? What they want. I know that's, well, you're supposed to give the people what they, no you're not. You are not supposed to, as a pastor, you are not called to give the people what they want. No. No, no, no. 
you are to give the people what the Lord would give them. What the Lord would give them. Okay? That means not giving in, not giving or speaking to the people what they want or prefer, but rather giving them what they need. The only way to do this, the only way to do this is to be led by the Spirit. That is, remain closely connected to the Lord. You need to hear the mind of the Lord. You need to hear the mind of the Lord. The only one who knows what the people need is the Holy Ghost. He knows what the people need. He knows. And he is the one that will speak to you. And then you in turn speak to the people what the Lord has given you. But you don't give the people what they want. See, that's one of the problems that we have in the church today. Pastors and churches are feeding individuals what they want to hear. And the church is a mess. The church is a wreck. Because people don't, because people have rather itching ears. They have itching ears. Tell me how good everything is. Tell me how I'm going to prosper. Tell me how everything is going to be all right. Tell that's not the full counsel of God's word. That's not the full counsel of God's word. Sometimes there must be a hard word. Sometimes sin must be spoken of. The Bible says that judgment must begin in the house of God. And so we must be, as pastors, we must be very careful not to buy in to the temptation to give the people what they want to hear. No, 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 no. Speak to the Lord. The Lord will give you what the people need to hear. The Lord knows who is in attendance on that particular time that you happen to be preaching, that particular Sunday, that particular Wednesday or Thursday or whatever night that you stand before the people, whatever day. He knows who's there and he knows what they need. It may be one person in particular. Your message may speak to one heart and that may be the heart that needs to hear that word. That one person. And even if you don't see any responses, even if you don't see any responses, God's word will never return void, but it will accomplish the purpose wherewith it was sent every single time. Every single time. Think about Noah. Think about Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness. And he spoke for nearly 120 years. 120 years. And didn't have one convert not one convert. This is why the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God knows what he's doing. God knows who he chooses. He chose Noah. He needed someone who would not give up. He needed someone who would persevere. He needed someone like that. That's why God put his hand on a man like the Apostle Paul, who was Saul the terrorist at one time. That's why he put his hand on him. Because he knew that he could count on him. He knew that that man would be staunch, steadfast. Once he understood who Jesus Christ was, he would not give up. He would not back away. He understood that. God knows what he's doing. So don't give up. Don't give up. And don't give in to the temptation to give people what they want to hear. I know you want people to like you. I know you want people to. I want. I know you want people to come. You see, here, here, here's here's another truth that I found to be true. The more truth you preach, and this is not truth, not bashing truth, not your wrong, wrong, wrong truth, not not condescending truth. I'm not talking about always talking about down, down, and why you did that and sin, sin, sin. No, 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 no. We're not talking about that. That's part of what needs to happen, but not all the time. But when you begin to speak the truth, the truth, it will have one of two effects. People will be drawn to it or people will be repelled by it. And the more truth you speak, people will either be drawn to that word or they will be pushed to the side because they don't want to, they don't want to hear that. I found that to be the case many times that people are repelled. People are repelled. 
But you must not give in to giving the people what they want to hear. You must speak the truth in love. You must speak the truth in love. So that is, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, last week and this week, that is the pastor's place. The pastor's place. As we said, the pastor's place is the most prominent, meaning it's the most visible of the five-fold ministry functions. The pastor is the most visible. He's the Excuse me, he's the pastor. He's there every week. He's there every Sunday. He's there during the week, during prayer meeting, during Bible study many times. He's the pastor. He's the most visible of all of the fivefold ministry functions. But the pastor plays a vital role. The pastor plays a vital, vital role. Now, in the next few minutes before we close, let me just give a word on the sheep. The sheep need special care. The sheep need special care. We are the sheep of his pasture, the Bible says. And the term sheep and flock are actually not the most complimentary uh, terms that can be used to describe we who are the people of God. Because sheep have been termed to be very dumb, foolish, I've even heard the word stupid. But of course, that's not what we are. That's not who we are. But sheep are completely reliant. Completely reliant upon that shepherd. Completely reliant, okay? But God uses these terms and they apply, they describe, once again, our total dependency upon God's guidance. Okay, we need him, okay? So sheep need special care. That's what the pastor is there for, to care for the sheep, to care. Sheep have to be fed. That's why the pastor also needs to be fed himself. The pastor needs to be fed so he can feed. And he must feed properly. He must feed the sheep the proper food. He must give the sheep the proper diet. He must not give them things that they cannot digest. Listen, the pastor is so responsible for what he teaches. The pastor can be responsible for leading an entire congregation astray. Hear me. A pastor can be guilty of leading an entire congregation astray. It can happen if the pastor if leadership themselves have been led astray, they will in turn lead others astray. Pastor needs to be discerning. They need to be discerning. Okay? So discerning. Okay? Sheep get lost easily and have a tendency to wander. We don't like to admit it. We wouldn't want to admit that. We wander. Scripture says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Of us all. So we must, the pastor must to carry, the, 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 the pastor, the, the shepherd, the bishop holds that staff in his hand. And with that staff, he does not beat the sheep, but he gently prods them. To bring them back in line. That's what the pastor does. He keeps the sheep in line. So that they don't wander away. But what the pastor cannot do. He cannot be responsible for causing them to be out of line. That would be a mistake. Sheep are just defenseless. Defenseless. They are susceptible to only to, to almost any kind of of attack. They have no natural defense mechanisms whatsoever. They don't have powerful jaws. Uh, they don't have to ability, the ability to run fast. They are defenseless. We on our own, as sheep, we are defenseless on our own. We need him. 
We need him so much. Finally, sheep are only she uh, sheep are only safe when they are huddled together. They must be huddled together. We find strength in fellowship with one another as sheep. We need one another. Sometimes we don't like to admit that either. We need one another. And so we must continue. We must continue to be unified. We must continue to be in one accord. Scripture says there shall be one flock and there shall be one shepherd. One flock, one flock and one shepherd. So pastors are very, very uh, responsible, very responsible for for the completely, absolutely completely uh, responsible for the sheep that the Lord has given them. They must be very careful how they treat them, must be very careful how they feed them. So necessary. Amen. So we pray that you've been blessed tonight as we've talked about the pastor's place. It's a very prominent, very vital place. Now, when we come together, we come together next time, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about the teacher. That's the final ministry function. Talk about the teacher. Now, pastor is also a teacher. And so some of the same, some of the same characteristics and responsibilities of a pastor, the teacher shares, because the Bible says that the, the teacher, pastor in first timothy chapter three the pastor should also be able to teach able to teach so we're getting we'll get into the ministry of the teacher when we come together next time lord willing let's pray lord we bless your name we thank you once again for your word we thank you for your power lord we thank you for those pastors who are leading their flock in the, right, in the right direction. Lord, we thank you for those pastors who are preaching the message of the cross. We thank you for those pastors who are preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will turn all of what, who, whatever pastors there are that are leading their flocks away from the truth of the gospel. Lord, I pray that you will bring them back in line, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will cause them to see your light, Lord Jesus. Open up your word to them in a mighty way and cause them to see the error of their way. Lord, have your way. Bless us together right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. This is That's the Word Ministries. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. We come to you every Wednesday night with a Bible study for your soul. We're in the middle of a study, almost at the end actually of a study entitled Exploring the Fivefold Ministry talking about pastors the last two weeks and tomorrow night we're going next week we're going to be talking about the ministry of the teacher amen and so we bless the name of the lord uh, you can listen to all of our podcasts over spotify google Podcasts, itunes tune in radio and iheart radio uh you can find all of our podcasts on all the major podcast uh platforms uh we stream to you every wednesday night at this time over Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, and Spreaker.com. Spreaker.com is our podcast platform. We have several other podcasts that we produce. You go there, and I'm sure that you'll be blessed. You can also go to our website at that's the word.org. You can also go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. That's the Word Ministries, or type in Pastor Michael Jakes. That's yours truly, and that'll bring you right to our page, and I'm sure uh, that you'll be blessed by doing so. Amen. So we bless the name of the Lord. We thank you once again for joining us. We thank all of you who stopped in for a bit to watch and listen on tonight. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Hallelujah. And so we, we're we going to sign off. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget next week, the ministry of the teacher. We'll see you next time. May God bless you.